It's my great pleasure to um, host Ben today. Um, I was hoping that we would be able to meet in London uh, when we originally arranged this, but um, obviously we're unable to do this. Um, I first met Ben on an escalator at Kai and uh, we chatted all the way up the escalator and then seem to have continued to chat ever since. Um, some of you might uh, remember his student Diego who came to visit us at UCLIC uh, last year and um, uh, Ben is an assistant professor at University College Dublin where he um, co-directs the HCI group. Um, his primary research interest is voice user interfaces and uh, that's what he's going to talk to us about today and I guess the other thing to, to uh, just pop into the introduction here is that he founded the conference on conversational interfaces that started last year in 2019 um, and he was uh, one of the general chairs of the, com of the conference last year and he's also serving as papers chair for the conference this year. So I'll hand over to you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Anna, for, uh, for for inviting me, and thanks very much for having me um, having me again uh, to do a talk at, at UCLIX. I think the first time I was over there was maybe 2013, 2014, and so I'm really happy to come back and uh, and talk about some more of the work that I've done in the interim uh, around um, uh, voice user interfaces and speech. So today I'm going to talk about um, some of the work we've been doing looking at um, the concept of perspective taking um, and how that operates in human machine dialogue um, and what people kind of, or how, how people do this in uh, uh, voice user interface interaction. So um, to add to the, to the, uh, to the great instruction uh, that Anna gave there, so I'm um, assistant professor at UCD. Um, I'm also involved uh, in the ADAPT Centre, which is where a lot of this work uh, has been uh, funded from or has been involved um, uh, with. Uh, that's a centre looking at uh, multimodal interaction with a number of universities here, uh, sponsored by Science Foundation Ireland. And my general uh, interests are in speech interfaces, but also I have a background in cognitive and experimental psychology, and I have a kind of a, a mild obsession with psycholinguistics and applying that uh, to human computer interaction uh, um, uh, spheres and interaction and, and, and interactive paradigms. So one of the major things that really drives my work and drives my kind of enthusiasm for this area is, is isn't necessarily the, the machine oriented aspect of, uh, of voice user interfaces, but this kind of interaction. It's uh, the interaction between between people, so how we speak to each other, and importantly, how we kind of mentalise about what people are thinking, know and understand. Uh, and we do this really quickly in human-human dialogue, uh, and generally this is uh, under the research uh, of perspective taking uh, in dialogue. And uh, we use a number of cues to be able to do this, and this is why we're so efficient and effective at it. We use these cues as heuristics to give us a sense of what that partner we're talking to might kind of know and understand. So we kind of shape our utterances accordingly. Well, there's a debate actually in the field of psycholinguistics about how much we shape uh, our utterances. And I'm going to touch a little bit on that when I talk about voice user interfaces in this, in this situation. But really most of the work that we look at at UCD is trying to apply what we know in this situation, so what we do in human-human dialogue, and see how those kind of behaviours or those kind of theoretical frameworks actually operate in this kind of interaction, in an interaction with um, whether it's Amazon Alexa or Google Home, or whether it's something more generic. So uh, it could just be a human, uh, a human machine um, spoken interaction through a laptop, uh, or uh, something through, say, for instance, like a robot or something like that. So this is where um, this is fundamentally um, uh, where the foundation of our work comes from. It's this idea of moving a lot of the theoretical views from human-human dialogue to human-machine dialogue. And one of the core uh, concepts within human-human dialogue that we look at in particular is this idea of uh, what's termed an interlocutor model or a partner model. And it's what we think the partner knows and understands and how that shapes our utterances and interaction. Now, critically for us, and I suppose, I suppose good for us in terms of the fact that we're doing this work, is that we know very little actually about how people build these models uh, of their partner in, in voice user interface interaction. We know a lot about human-human interaction, still finding out an awful lot more of course, um, but we know very little about what drives these models. And so 
Firstly, that's, uh, so I'm going to talk about um, sort of three major questions that kind of go through our work uh, today. Um, and so the first one I'm going to talk about is really what actually drives these kind of models. So again, these models are this idea of the uh, assumptions that we make about knowledge and competence uh, of our dialogue partners linguistically. Uh, and how we then form our references based around those. And again, human-human dialogue suggests that we use a number of kind of cues such as like accents and things like that to be able to make at least initial um, uh, assumptions about what a partner might know and understand. Uh, Susan Brennan calls these global uh, models. So this idea that we might have a model in general that's stereotypical and then we might change that as we interact with a person. So that might change from a global to a local model. So. Our question firstly is that what might drive these in voice user interface interaction and so from this we did it we, we uh, did an exploratory study to try and find this out uh, we tried to get a sense of what might be one of the most fundamental things that might be driving this so this piece of work uh, was published at mobile hci in 2017 um, and we looked at trying to understand uh, the overarching experience that people were having with intelligent personal assistants so they're kind of the most familiar voice interfaces or voice user interfaces we all experience that would be things like siri google assistant um, and uh, and amazon alexa and so we asked in this case, in this work, we focused on Siri users because Siri was at the time the most popular, um, the most popular uh, uh, IPA. But really, um, that's been overtaken by Google Assistant, I think now. Um, and so we got 20 people to participate in focus groups talking about um, uh, experiences they had. Importantly, these were all infrequent intelligent personal assistant users. And that was the most common use, uh, common user groups within uh, this uh, uh, within uh, IPA use at the time. So, um, so Luger and Selwyn did some work in 2016 that was published at Kai looking at kind of power users uh, of these uh, interfaces, whereas we looked at more common aspects of uh, people who just use them infrequently and didn't really get involved too much in them from a day-to-day -day basis. And these are all created from the UCD campus. Now, importantly from this piece of work what we did was we asked them to also refresh their kind of experiences by getting to conduct a number of tasks when we completed uh, this study so we asked them to do typical tasks like finding out what the weather's like in dublin sending a text to someone in your contacts or setting reminders and these are typical tasks um, that you see people doing with intelligent personal assistants in fact a paper in tokai in 2019 kind of bears a lot of this out when you see the types of tasks that people are doing right now with intelligent personal assistants so before the focus group we asked people to complete these tasks and reflect on the experiences they had within the tasks as well as how that echoed with their experience that they had with IPAs more um, uh, 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 before they, they completed the tasks. So, um, so we conducted, um, we got people to, uh, to complete these um, uh, tasks and, and write down their reflections um, and then they brought these to the to the to the focus group days uh, where we got people to discuss these uh, these tasks. So these two are key for this idea of partner models. So there's a sense that we might have our global model being driven by this idea of human-like nature, and then speech recognition performance might lead us to adapt our models accordingly based on how the performance occurs in that type of interaction. So this might lead us to, to kind of finesse our uh, our uh, perceptions and understanding of what the system can and can't do. So. Importantly, we found these two kind of key dimensions here that we uh, that we need to consider. And the human-like nature of IPAs is something so fundamental to the design that it's going to come through again and again in the talk. And so this is one of the things that we want to understand more fully. If it is the thing that is driving the global or these kind of stereotypical models initially, we need to try and understand what the dimensions of that humanness are, how people perceive that, and whether that has has a has an impact in general. Um, uh, across some of the different components that we see and also whether that should be the appropriate design in the first place. So from this work we kind of went to understand right okay we've got this idea of the human-like nature of intelligent personal assistance being fundamentally important to the interaction and if you go through the speech technology literature it's almost kind of a fait accompli that you would see these human, uh, the human-like qualities being imbued in systems. Uh, it's only recently uh, with work by Roger Moore uh, and a few others in the field that have uh, tried to get a sense of is that really the most appropriate way forward. But at the moment there's a lot of drive to find out what is this human-like perception that people have and so we try to get a sense of okay what is 
this kind of uh, uh, what what does this kind of mean this human likeness and what dimensions within this are relevant to those uh, to those judgments so that it might just be not be a unidimensional thing you might make human like judgments on particular um, uh, parts of the interaction uh, and not on others. Uh, it might be that you make particular um, uh, assessments uh, based on voice and and based on uh, based on the output from the system uh, rather than something else that you're experiencing. So what we try to find out is, is one of my PhD students, uh, Philip Doyle, um, uh, conducted a piece of research that was published in Mobile HCI last year, trying to find exactly that. What's the dimensions of this human likeness? What's the dimensions that are important to this human, this perception, intelligent personal assistance? And what might be driving some of that? So what could be some of the categories we'd see as important? So as part of this, we used uh, a technique from personal construct theory, um, which is a which is kind of um, uh, a process that kind of casts people as naive scientists uh, who try to make their um, sense of their experiences through kind of writing um, two kind of dichotomous words about the particular dimensions that they have about particular things that they've experienced. And so, um, so in, uh, in uh, uh, the technique that, that's described there is called repertory grids. So it's um, in this repertory grid, you're asking people to try and give you terms, dichotomous terms, that signify what they're kind of thinking about the interaction, in particular how they're mentalizing about the particular interaction. And the literature highlights this is actually really good for trying to find out how people think about the interaction and what they're kind of, um, uh, what they're uh, thinking cognitively in uh, whenever interacting with a partner. And it's also very good for comparing types of partners that we may have. So in this experiment, what we did is that we got, um, the, so the technique works by having three uh, entities. So in this case here, we had three entities that people uh, interacted with. So in this case, the entities are partners. Um, and importantly for this technique to work, you tend to get two entities that are very similar. So in this case, we had people interact with Amazon Alexa or, uh, or Apple Siri. Uh, and then we had uh, one of them that's distinct. So in this case, we had them interacting with, uh, with uh, another member of the lab uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in an experiment. So this technique, uh, uh, we, we uh, get them to interact with all three of these entities, uh, conducting um, uh, particular tasks that we give them, and then we ask them to write down um, as many uh, dichotomous pairs of words that they can think of that allows them to make a comparison between these entities. So in this case here, we're looking at the human uh, as, a, a, as the extreme partner here, and then we're looking at the, uh, at the two IPAs as the other distinct categories. Um, and so we got 24 uh, native or near native English speaking participants to, uh, to, to conduct this. Uh, and we asked each of these participants to conduct nine predetermined tasks with each of these entities. Um, and so the task was split into different kind of um, different kind of questions or kind of things that we would expect systems to be good at and humans to be bad at, as well as uh, humans to be good at and systems to be bad at. And so the first category we've got them to complete were conversational tasks, so things like how are you today, where are you from, uh, tell me a joke. Um, so the, whoever's asked so Amazon Alexa for jokes, you can tell the jokes kind of vary in their quality in that regard. Um, you also then have information retrieval tasks, which technically, which, which, you know, um, intelligent personal assistants tend to be very good at. Uh, we then also had a section which is sort of subjective or opinion based, which again seemed to be uh, better for the uh, for humans to do than systems to do. So um, and so this was this allows uh, our participants to experience different types of questions or different types of interactions that they may have a positive uh, or negative experience with each of the partners with. So as I said before, we got to uh, we got them to complete the tasks, and then we asked them to go through this what is called a construct elicitation phase. And in here, we're asking them to get firstly an implicit construct, so they write a list of words down one side of a page that best describes the key similarities and differences between the dialogue partners that they've had. And then there's what's called the emergent construct, so something that the so the antonym of the word that they've just written uh, for uh, or the words they've just written for those partners. And so you end up with something like this. So it looks like uh, kind of a grid that they have for, we have for each participant, uh, and then we ask them to mark on that grid where they see the human, where they see uh, uh, Amazon Alexa, and when they see where they see Apple Siri on these uh, dimensions. So the dimensions were used in this case to allow us to make a sense 
of what's happening with the interaction and, and, and where people place those rather than being used as quantitative data. So what we found from this is that basically um, people found that obviously the intelligent personal assistants were good for fact-based and universal knowledge uh, and they were pretty terrible for experiential or, um, uh, or what some people termed as kind of biased or contextualized knowledge. They felt that sort of humans had an element of bias to their, to their knowledge. Um, obviously that can be debated whether uh, IPAs also have bias to their knowledge too. Um, and uh, there was a sense of that actually simulating this experiential knowledge in the interaction with voice interfaces was kind of seen as, uh, as uh, with, with, with a lot of distrust from the users. There was almost a sense of someone's pre-programmed something that's meant to be uh, a human-like quality that was seen as kind of negative in that interaction. So this idea of simulating empathy or interpersonal collection was seen as kind of completely false from the participants. So these, the, uh, the, uh, all, these, uh, all these things came from a, from a semi-structured interview that we ran uh, after the uh, concept elicitation phases. So if we look at the constructs as well, we see a number of categories uh, that, were, that, that come out of that. We uh, did a thematic analysis on these categories um, uh, and we did um, sort of independent coding on that and more details are in the paper in terms of how that was conducted. Um, and uh, we found that there are indeed a number of different dimensions and we're going to pull a few out that are really important for this idea of partner modeling. So the first one here is partner knowledge set. So this idea of what knowledge the partner has. So we have this in human-human dialogue. We can use, say for instance, if we know someone's job or we know someone's background, we might make a, an assumption that uh, they know something in particular. So if I meet somebody and I find out they're from Aberdeen, which is where I'm from, then I might have certain assumptions about what they know, especially if I'm directing them around the city uh, when I there. Um, so we have this uh, assumption of, of what's called partner knowledge set in this regard. We also have then this idea of linguistic content or, or vocal qualities. So, um, so the idea that the system is using particular, uh, particular words or is using particular short or long answers, we have expectations about what should be occurring with those types of systems uh, that may be driving our, uh, our perceptions of what the system can and should be doing. Same thing as well with vocal qualities, that there's a sense of, uh, of, um, of the synthesis of the, uh, this being used for the speech output uh, might be driving some of these differences in perceptions, some of these, uh, some of these uh, assumptions of what the system can and can't do, and what we think might be appropriate for systems. So for instance, that the uh, cheery and emotion emotional might not be seen as appropriate, um, whereas people see systems as being dull and emotionless, for instance, in that regard. One of the key things I want to stress here as well, though, is that people were very clear that there were obviously differences between these partners. So rather than having this idea of emulating humans in the, in the interaction to completely um, uh, make, uh, make people interact with these systems like they do other humans, there was a category boundary that was important for the perceptions of the system, uh, system competence, that really um, is very hard to move uh, in that regard. And I'll be talking a bit more about that in a piece of work that I'll be, uh, be finishing off with in, in, in the talk. So there's this idea, and then Susan Brennan talked about this at the, uh, the keynote she gave at the Conversational User Interfaces Conference, that users aren't dumb. So they're not gonna be fooled by the idea that they're speaking to a human or, uh, whenever they're speaking to a, to, to a system. Um, uh, uh, in, in that regard, depending on how good or bad the synthesis is going to be. And that's another debate that we can have uh, and that we can have across the way if you're going to make it more human. But there's a sense of that people do understand there's a difference between these two types of partners and what they know and understand. And that's important when we're coming to design. So we see that this human-like this human-like um, uh, concept seems to have these different types of dimensions that may be important to the perceptions that people have around this. But does this make any difference at all? So, uh, you know, this could be, a, could, could be a nice kind of piece about what, um, what happens uh, to, part, to people thinking about human likeness and interaction, but if it doesn't have any, it, does it actually have any, uh, any actual behavioral difference in interaction uh, with the system? So should we be thinking about what this makes people do in interaction? So for instance, could human-like design choices uh, actually affect our language choices? So if I feel that a system uh, is cueing something uh, that highlights a heuristic that I use in human-human dialogue, will I end up using that uh, in that regard? And that could be, uh, that might be something to consider when you're designing a human-like system in this regard, because you need to then know what's happening with those human-like cues that you're putting into the system. If it impacts the way people interact with the system, that's going to be quite important to know. So the key thing here is that we all come with baggage. 
in in this interaction and uh so so from our thinking around partner models is this idea that we have this baggage of heuristics and interaction uh in in speech interaction that we use particular cues and these particular cues may drive particular choices that we make and we use those heuristics uh in in uh, in uh, in in producing our speech in this type of interaction as an example of this so um so this um is uh, is uh, is coriander uh, and obviously if we're from the states this might be the term uh, uh, terms as cilantro now if i was going shopping with michael d higgins our fine president here in ireland i might say to michael d pass me the coriander right so i'm using the cue the fact that he's from ireland that he may understand that term better than elizabeth warren for instance if i was interact if i was speaking with her uh, and we were in the uh, in one of the shops picking up some some uh, some coriander i may use the term cilantro and that's a classic audience design effects and the reason why that occurs and there's debate within this within the psycholinguistics literature uh, is partly just the fact that i'm thinking about what they might know and understand before i produce it and so the cue that i have here is potentially through the accent they use so if i hear elizabeth talk i might think okay she's from the us i'm going to use the term cilantro whereas if i speak to, to michael d and i hear the irish accent I might then use something that's more um, uh, that's uh, more easy for him to un to understand uh, uh, from my lexical choices. In this case, being coriander. So this is the the thinking behind one of the experiments that we ran that was published at the CUI conference in 2019, uh, looking at lexical choice in particular and how the accent of a system or the nationality perceptions or, or assumptions that we make of a system um, might drive our language choices. And so in this case, what we did is we, we, we use a classic referential communication paradigm that's used a lot in psycholinguistics to look at lexical choice. And uh, these uh, tend to be kind of games where you're describing particular uh, objects or particular pictures that you see. You're naming objects in those pictures uh, and you take turns doing that. In this experiment, because we were looking at uh, US uh, lexical alternatives and, uh, and Hiberto English lexical alternatives, we wanted to ensure that the partners had knowledge about those alternatives. So we asked them to familiarize with 18 pictures and the terms, uh, US terms and Hiberto English terms related with those pictures. And we kind of, we said to them beforehand that this wasn't part of the experiment. This was kind of a, a memory test uh, that they had before. And of course we debriefed them afterwards to say that this actually was part of the experiment afterwards. But this was to kind of give them the, the knowledge they could use to choose the items if they wanted to, to choose the descriptions they wanted to, if they wanted to be more felicitous to the, um, to the partner they had. Um, so the second stage of the experiment then uh, was the referential communication tasks. And this is where the partner uh, and the, uh, the partner being the uh, computer or um, the computer in this regard, um, or, uh, and, the, and the participants take turns as matcher and namer. So uh, when you're the matcher, uh, you basically hear a description from your partner and you select uh, one of the two images that you see in front of you. When you're the namer, then you have to name the item that's selected to your partner. And so uh, this is similar to a number of uh, studies done in human-human and human-machine dialogue um, uh, interactions. And so to get, get a, bit, uh, get a bit, bit more of, a, of an idea around what this is here, it's very low-tech in terms of how it's set up, it's no bells and whistles. Um, but in the mattress screen, you'd see two images. And in this example here, you'd see the participant um, uh, here's It's the book. Uh, and in this case, as a, part, a participant in a matcher, you'd, uh, the matcher turn, you'd click on the book. Uh, in the namer screen, you'd see a red box around an item. Now, if I was speaking to, a, um, uh, to someone with a US accent, uh, I might say it's the wrench to describe that if I was using audience design, if I was designing my utterance, designing my lexical choice based on what I think the partner knows. But in this case, if I was speaking to an, uh, to an Irish partner uh, or an Irish accented partner, for instance, I might say it's the spanner because I feel that's more felicitous for them to understand uh, in, uh, in, in this type of interaction. So uh, in this experiment, we had 72 native, uh, native English speakers uh, and the experiment was a Wizard of Oz experiment. So we, 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 recorded, the, um, we recorded the computer um, describing all the items that need to be described in um, uh, in the experiment, and they were either in a um, it was either in a, an Irish accented voice 
or uh, uh, an American accented voice. And we used uh, Irish accented and US accented synthesis. Now, I'm not gonna play this for you because the last time I tried to do this, it, it went, uh, it went um, terribly. So, um, so I put the names of the synthesis, you can, you can look it up on the Sarah, Sarah Proc or Sarah Voice website. Um, but we had Irish accented synthesis, which is Sarah Voice Caitlin, um, and the US accented speech, which is Sarah Voice Hannah. Um, and, uh, and that was, uh, uh, those are the conditions of the experiment. In the experiment, we also told participants that we were interact that they were um, they were interacting with either a US uh, US partner or an Irish partner in this interaction. And so what we found uh, uh, in the experiment was that, and sorry, I should say the data looks at the uh, number of times people use uh, Amer American English lexical alternatives, so American English uh, lexical names in the interaction um, throughout the game. And so we ran a um, mixed effects model to identify the likelihood that people have to use that. But this is an illustration of how many, um, uh, how much percentage of American English names we found in each of the conditions. Uh, and we found that as expected from an audience design effect, that you'd see more people using US um, uh, or uh, American English terms uh, when interacting with an American English partner, uh, with, a, with an American partner than when interacting with an Irish partner. Uh, in these interactions. Now it's worth noting here that it's not completely swamping uh, the, um, uh, um, it's not completely swamping the lexical choices. So people are still using Hiberto English uh, lexical choices uh, in these interactions when they have that alternative more frequently. It's just the frequency of US alternatives is being increased. The likelihood of seeing that in the data is increased in the US um, participant condition, the US computer condition. So we seem to be seeing a similar effect with uh, an audience design, uh, in this case with systems that we do with human partners. Uh, and this is important for the design of these systems because it suggests that the, 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 the choices that we're making might be driving us to use those shortcuts, those heuristics that we have in human dialogue um, uh, and might be actually altering or, or allowing us to change or make a decision on our lexical terms. Well, that's fine if you want them to do that, uh, but also if we're thinking about designing for, for human likeness, we need to be damn sure that that's not going to be leading to any negative effects or effects that we don't expect in the type of interaction that we, that, that, uh, that we, that we might have. So this kind of piece of work highlights that that's actually important. We need to understand or need to think about what the human aspects are in this type of interaction because it may actually be uh, changing our language choices uh, and guide across this way. It's obviously, of course, an opportunity to guide speech in a particular way too. Um, uh, so, so this human likeness seems to be guiding our language choices and seems to be a kind of a default design choice that we make with voice user interfaces. And it seems to be kind of multidimensional, multifaceted. There seems to be a number of things that drive that, um, that perception. It might be the, the kind of words that are being used, the voice that's being used. And also we kind of try and make, we make perceptions about what the partner might know and understand based upon these. But should we be aiming for this in the first place in our agents? And this is one of the things where we're at at the moment in the, in the KUI community and also in the Kai community around conversational user interfaces is that, okay, there's this human likeness in design that we can build in, but should we be building it in in the first place? What's the benefits and what are the drawbacks? We've kind of shown that there may be some benefit in guiding users to be able to use particular language or particular um, uh, particular choices, a uh, lexical choice in particular. Um, but it also may confuse, it might make people feel that the systems are more advanced than they are or not. And this is more, probably more pronounced when it gets the sense of conversation. So rather than we looking at sort of task-based or task-oriented dialogues, where we see a number of uh, very simple tasks being done, which is what intelligent personal assistants are good at right now. What happens when we go to a fully conversational system? So when we're trying to instill social talk or we're trying to instill this kind of companion-like system uh, that we have. Because in conversation, we don't just talk for task. We talk also for, um, uh, for, for, for social goals in the same way too, um, uh, in that regard. And they're very different types of conversation. But the idea uh, um, uh, that's going through the, the literature at the moment is it should we really be thinking about going for a kind of a, a future with interfaces, conversational user interfaces that are very similar to the film Her with Theodore Twombly falling in love with his, uh, with his operating system. Uh, I don't want to wreck the ending for anybody, so I won't say what happens in the end. It doesn't end well for Theodore, sadly. Um, he gets his heart broken. But, um, but so what we wanted to find out here was that firstly, you know, do we want to go for this future? Uh, in this regard? And do users actually really feel that this is appropriate or not? Is this this aspect of constantly striving for, for human-like conversation with an agent um, uh, an appropriate thing to consider? 
And what would these dimensions be, would these conversational dimensions be in this type of interaction? And so we had a, a paper um, uh, published recently at CHI that received an honorable mention um, in 2019, uh, looking at this exact topic. So looking at uh, getting people to, um, to, to reflect on what the important characteristics of conversation that they have with others, and then trying to twist that on its head and trying to get them to reflect on those characteristics when thinking about uh, human machine dialogues or, or having dialogues with a, with a system. And then trying to get them to look at appropriate scenarios for this type of interacting with agents. Now, the fourth didn't work here. So when we looked at the semi-structured interviews, we tried to go through these themes. The fourth didn't work. People, people found it very hard to kind of um, to, 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 to think of appropriate uh, scenarios or kind of a, a future where these uh, kind of conversations would be, would be appropriate. But what we found was that highlighting the social linguistic literature, uh, that conversation has a number of purposes. So it has social and transactional purposes. So we don't just converse to get stuff done. We converse to, uh, to, to have a social bond with people, to build trust and to build mutual, uh, mutual understanding, but also kind of, a, kind of a, 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 a mutual kind of friendly experience that we have. And so we have a lot of social talk for that. Um, and then we also had this idea that we try and build mutual understanding and try and build a common ground uh, whenever we have an interaction. So how Clark's concept of common ground, whenever you're interacting with, uh, with people, there's a shared knowledge state that's built between individuals. This kind of thing is seen by users as very important and a very important thing for human-human dialogue uh, to have. And also having that shared context how allows you build that. We also had this idea that conversation is important for trust, for, for building trust and building sort of a trustworthy interaction. And a fundamental element of this is that people are active and participatory listeners. In human dialogue, we have, uh, you know, we can we see cues that people have when they're interacting. So either head nods, using back channels and through verbal speech to give a sense of that people are active and active participants and that humour being an important part of doing that too. And these are all echoed in sociolinguistics literature. Now, whenever we go to agent conversation, it was, it was, it was apparent that people had a very different view of what that conversation kind of is. Uh, and that it's definitely not the same as human-human conversation. It might possibly never be. Um, so this idea that there's a, there's a fundamental perception of this being transactional rather than social, the idea of building a social connection between a system, between a voice user interface was quite, a, 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 um, quite an odd one for our participants. And so there's a sense that these might fully be, be seen as just fully transactional interactions. There's a thing that goes through a lot of our work that, where people comment on there's a master, um, uh, kind of a, a master servant relationship between um, uh, a user and a system. And that is very hard to change as a dynamic. There's also a sense of one-way understanding. The system may not necessarily be understanding you in the classic way that we think of understanding in dialogue, um, dialogue interaction. And so it's the sense of that it's that people are very aware that they that the words are being recognised by by speech recognition algorithms, uh, and then something that's akin to understanding occurs uh, and and spews out a response uh, for them, uh, and almost seem to be kind of fooled, but meant to be kind of trying to be fooled by that type of interaction. There's also a sense of it being rather than common ground building, mutual common ground building, building there's a sense of personalization instead so that the system could understand a lot about you or know about you, but there was no sense of learning together. There's a sense of the system could hoover up data about you uh, and use that in their responses, but not necessarily allow you to, to, uh, to build that mutually. And again, there's this idea of status effects. So a sense being talking to a system versus talking to a human, very different, but also this idea that the system was subservient to the, to the user. It was needed, it, uh, the user needed to conduct a particular thing with it and it had to do something for the user. And so there's a sense of rather than it being trustworthy, the conversation being there to build trustworthiness, there's a review of functional trustworthiness. So it's that the system can understand what I do, so it can therefore execute what I want it to do. And so these were kind of stark contrast to conversational type of, uh, uh, of, uh, of important aspects of conversation within the, uh, for the, for, for human conversation. So in this sense, it's actually, so if we think about trying to emulate human conversation with systems, like the human agent, agent conversation is not going to be that. It's not going to be human, human conversation. So my argument here and the argument that we have that from our work in the lab is that we should potentially not necessarily stop trying, but think about potential ways where this may be actually needed because it might actually be harder to realize than we, than we think because of the, the differences in people's perceptions of what conversation should be with systems. So it may never be this type of human-human type of conversation. And that's kind of okay. 
uh, you know, these types of conversations might uh, have their purpose and have a and and have their use. And so there's a. It may not. We may not be able to get to this idea of being huge, truly human-like in our conversation with systems, mainly due to the fact that we see them as very different conversational entities and having very different dynamics in conversation. But we also see them as being good or bad at different things. So that these you know, systems might be good at fact, knowledge, and this kind of thing like that, but not very good at opinion-oriented aspects. So having conversations about opinions is going to be very odd to have with a system and if we even if we do have that in the system it may not be seen as very truthful so we might have to come to the realization when we're designing these systems that it's okay to have these different types of conversations uh, that we have in this type of interaction so just to sum up um so um so i would say this because because we kind of research this kind of thing but partner models i think is one of the most important user concepts to consider in this interface what we perceive the system to be able to do and understand and how that forms what we say is kind of fundamental to what how this interaction is run and we need to understand more about it we're really just starting to understand that a bit more borrowing things from sociolinguistics as well as theory of mind research and we also we bring priors to this from human human from human dialogue, and that might be a system uh, um, a symptom of design um, uh, or an, or a nature or the nature of interaction. So we need to be aware of that when we're designing these systems. We bring priors, and that might influence the users to do things in particular ways. They're, they're perfectly logical to do, and that they're using priors from human human dialogue, uh, but they also then may break down. So that might bring its own type of problems uh, if we're looking at them more widely. So we need to kind of think when human likeness might be more uh, most appropriate. Um, and my own personal view on this is that, that actually, the, that this might kind of bring a ceiling effect. Um, uh, that, that the fact that there's a, there's a that, that we see these as systems and that we're not going to blur the lines anytime soon, that there may be a ceiling effect to how human-like we can get the conversation to be with these types of systems. And I, I don't believe that there's a particular need at the present to do that kind of thing. In, uh, there may be certain situations in certain areas where we may need to, but I think that uh, the jury's out where they are. And we need to find those types of things before just going for a human-like interaction as standard. So. In, uh, in that sense, uh, I'm going to leave you with Mark Zuckerberg and data. Uh, so the sense of, you know, sort of giving an eerie sense of humanness, we need to kind of consider what that is going to do to this type of interaction. And I just want to thank the funders, uh, so Science Foundation Ireland, Darius Research Council, uh, everyone at HCI UCD as well, and the ADAPT Centre. And this work wouldn't have happened with, um, without a number of people in the team here at HCI UCD. So um, before I finish, I also want to highlight that we uh, the Computational User Interfaces Conference that we ran in 2019. Uh, it was a great success. We're now running it again this year. It's not in Bilbao, Spain because of COVID-19. It's going to be in the, um, it's going to be uh, online uh, uh, virtually, run virtually. And so we should be, uh, uh, and it's going to be open to everybody. So I'd hope to see you, uh, to see a number of you there um, uh, if you can make it. Um, and without further ado, um, I just want to say thanks for inviting me and having me as, the, uh, as, as, as one of the first virtual speakers and I'm happy to take any questions.